We got to get uh, Kevin to stop signing the book so he can talk to us. Uh, I just want to tell everybody thank you for coming out today. And Thanks, when I think about putting together an event like this, co-sponsoring it uh, with the Republican group, the Nevada County Restaurant Coalition, um, we just love uh, being able to join together with like-minded people. And uh, you know, Chad and I were thinking about, and Donna, we were talking about uh, what are we going to do, you know, shutdowns and everything happening in our lives. And, you know, we sit in our office and we're praying, we're, we're doing the right, trying to do the fight. And then uh, messages start popping up with this guy named Kevin Kiley. And, and it, it started stirring something in us saying, you know, this, this is really cool. There's a guy that's out there fighting the battle for us. And um, it just really made us happy. So what I want to do is introduce Kevin. I'll, I'll put my glasses back on. I'm going to tell a little bit about you. Huh? Kevin was born and raised in, uh, in the community of the 6th Assembly District, and he graduated as a member of Granite Bay High. Uh, he's the son of a special education teacher, and he began his career as a high school teacher in South Central Los Angeles, where he chaired the English department. He holds a bachelor degree from Harvard, law degree from Yale, master's in secondary education from Loyola Marymount. In the assembly, he serves as a vice chair of two, community, two committees, the Assembly Education Committee, Privacy Consumer Protection Committee. He's a member of the Housing Community Development and Judiciary Committee of Higher Education. He's an assemblyman. He's won statewide acc acclamation for his uh, legislation to expand parental choice for underserved students, ensure transparency in government, and end the practice of government double taxation. Offered several, uh, authored several bills to advance education, safety, and criminal justice. But as you all know, we're here today with Kevin because he's inspired us uh, in his victorious win in a lawsuit against Gavin Newsom. Yeah. That makes me happy. <laughs> he challenged the emergency authority power during coronavirus shutdown. He and uh, James Gallagher stated that California Constitution has explicit separation of power and Governor Newsom has violated a California governor constitutionally is forbidden from doing the very thing that Governor Newsom has done. He exercised legislative powers. Only the legislator can do that. So it was not a surprise on January 1st, the California Globe announced the winners and the losers. <laughs> I, I, I got that from your blog. Come yeah, on, yeah. come on, come on. And one of the winners at the very top was Kevin Kiley. <laughs> and, and, I don't have to say, on that list, they had the biggest loser. Who was it? <laughs> he was announced as the biggest loser of 2020. So I'm pleased to prevent, present you to the man that I admire, inspire us, who fights the daily battle for us, Kevin. What an introduction. Yeah. Well, thank you, Ken, for hosting this event. I mean, uh, and pulling this together, and uh, for the, the battles you're fighting here in Nevada County. Uh, I think it's really inspiring, and you're working all of the angles as well. You're going to court, and you're promoting the Healthy Communities Resolution, and you're promoting the recall. So uh, that's exactly what it's going to take. So round of applause. Okay. <laughs> I also want to thank God for the weather. I mean, this is amazing. Yeah. I was talking with Bob, like it's going to be, you know, rainy and cold and what's going to happen. This is beautiful. So I knock on wood. And it, we keep getting these signs, like the events I've done have had great weather. Uh, President Biden gave his first weekly address last weekend. And uh, if you've seen my blog, you might know what happened. Of all people, he chooses a woman from Roseville, who's my constituent, who told the president about how it, Gavin Newsom's incompetent EDD management kept her from getting her claim, and then my office helped her to start it out. 
So if that's not a sign, then the president's first weekly address features me cleaning up Gavin Newsom's mess. <laughs> what are the odds? But I want to thank Bob and everyone with the Nevada County Republican Party. This is just a wonderful, wonderful chapter in our state party. Uh, and uh, I have been thrilled to build a relationship with, uh, with you guys over the last few years. And I think you're really a shining example for the whole state. So thank you very much. And thank you everyone for being here to be part of the greatest citizens movement in California history. Anyone sign the recall petition, by the way? Anyone here sign these recall petitions that are going around? Anyone gather signatures to submit? Thank you very much. I mean, you are really making history one signature at a time. And there's one other person I want to thank, and it's actually another constituent of mine, Gavin Newsom. <laughs> I mean, I wasn't expecting to write a book, so I guess I can thank him for that. And yes, while he's ruining many of our lives and ruining our state, I think we have one other thing to thank him for. And that is that he has demonstrated more eloquently than I or anyone ever could everything that is wrong with politics in California. I mean, this guy has put blaring neon lights above the state capitol saying this is the problem. And people are starting to see it. He's taken every perversity of our state's politics and put it on steroids over the last year. As he's led the single worst COVID-19 response in the United States, if not the larger Western world. I mean, I think it was Jerry Brown's press secretary, Gil Duran, who put it best. He said, when history called, Newsom walked. People of California stepped up heroically. Our governor let us down repeatedly. He took extraordinary emergency powers and abused them for personal political gain. He took all of our shared sacrifice and cashed it in for self-promotion. And that's the first of the eight adjectives I use to describe Gavin Newsom's worst in the nation COVID-19 response. Each of the adjectives is its own chapter. The first one is self-promotional. Now, does anyone here doubt that Governor Newsom used the arrival of the coronavirus on our shores to launch his 2024 presidential campaign? I mean, you remember when this thing first started. His press conferences were just must-see TV, weren't they? They'd be breathlessly advertised, tune in today at noon, coronavirus update. He'd tease major announcements, which would turn out to be like a new stay-at-home order. <laughs> he hit the daytime and late night talk show circuit. He was on Ellen. He was on The View multiple times. He was on Jimmy Kimmel. He was on The Daily Show. One veteran political consultant said he was trying to use sizzle. He tried to build sizzle. But there was something that was, he was, it was bothering Gavin. It was rankling him, even as he was reveling in all of this attention. There was another governor who was getting a lot more of it. He was now in hot water of his own. <laughs> But Andrew Cuomo, I mean, his press conferences got carried live on CNN. He even won an Emmy for them, which is kind of crazy. <laughs> and so to try to get some of the spotlight from Cuomo, Newsom just starts resorting to the, these just crazy announcements. He's making things up. He's, uh, you know, hyping things way beyond what they actually are. Uh, the Sacramento Bee, which had endorsed him, dubbed him Governor Gaslight. <laughs> and this all culminated with one of the biggest scandals in California history, the BYD China affair. If anyone remembers this, where the governor behind the back of the legislature reached a $1 billion no-bid deal for masks with one of the world's sketchiest companies that is run by the Chinese Communist Party. By the way, the masks failed multiple safety tests from federal regulators here in the United States. And the reason he did it was so that he could go on the Rachel Maddow show on primetime cable news and declare California to be a nation state. Surely Andrew Cuomo couldn't compete with that, right? <laughs> and it actually worked initially. The next morning you could almost hear the sound of champagne corks popping in the governor's office as hashtag President Newsom had started trending on Twitter. Well, I can assure you that will never be trending on Twitter again, unless it's like ironic. What I think we're going to see trending on Twitter this year is hashtag former Governor Newsom. Yeah. 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 
So the second adjective is lawless, which our friend Ken has already alluded to. And when I think about the lawless one-man rule of Gavin Newsom, to me it starts on April 1st. He's holding a press conference and he's asked by a reporter, do you see the coronavirus as an opportunity for a new progressive era? And what did he say? He says, yes, I do. I do see it as an opportunity to reimagine a new progressive era as it relates to capitalism. We do see it as an opportunity to reshape the way we do business and the way we govern. The answer, he said, is yes. And to that end, he has put our civic institutions through a paper shred. You know, the rule of law, separation of powers, checks and balances, representative democracy, the Constitution itself. He's fashioned himself, I say, in the mold of an ancient Roman dictator. This idea that, he's said this multiple times in our case, that the state of emergency centralizes all of the state's powers in his hands. That's why we took Gavin Newsom to court, and that's why we won. Yeah. And I'm confident that the California Supreme Court will uphold that decision. We don't have dictatorships in modern America. The third adjective, corrupt. Now, you might not remember this. It's been a while, but Gavin Newsom actually had an economic recovery commission. Does anyone remember this? So it came together in, uh, I think it was April, like mid-April of last year. It had all these luminaries on it. Uh, the president of Disney uh, was on it, although he later resigned. Uh, 80 members. And does anyone remember? And it, oh, by the way, it disbanded in December because mission accomplished, right? The economy is doing great. Does anyone remember who Gavin Newsom put in charge of this commission? Tom Steyer. Oh. The vanity presidential candidate with the, the interesting plaid ties. Now, he was fresh off the presidential campaign trail at this point. But not only was he a vanity presidential candidate, he was also the single biggest Democrat political donor, not only in California history, but in the history of the United States giving over $250 million to Democrat candidates. That's who Gavin Newsom put in charge of California's quote unquote economic recovery. And that to me is actually Gavin Newsom's defining quality. It's why I put it on the cover. Is he simply sells access and power and influence to the highest bidder, which is a big problem when he claims he has unlimited power. We saw this with AB5, the ban on independent contracting, as he's ruthlessly used COVID-19 and the state of emergency to hammer it in. And perhaps worst of all, in order to please his biggest campaign donor, the biggest campaign donor in the state, the CTA, California Teachers Association, he has shut down our schools longer than any state in the country and caused incalculable harm to millions of kids that we will be dealing with for a long, long time. And that doesn't make you America's most corrupt governor. I don't know what does. So the fourth adjective is unscientific. Anyone follow Gavin Newsom on Twitter? No. <laughs> I wouldn't recommend. <laughs> if you really want to get to know Gavin Newsom, now that you really would, follow his tweets. Let me give you a little sample of a few Gavin Newsom tweets. This is from April 14th of last year. Oh, and when I raise my voice a little bit, that's when he's using all caps. <laughs> Gavin loves the all caps truth. When it comes to reopening, science, not politics, must be California's guy. A couple weeks later, this is a little bit of a shot at Cuomo. The West Coast is and will continue to be guided by science. <laughs> on May 4th, California is led by data and science. June 24th, this isn't about politics, this is about science. And the next day, Dr. Fauci is right. This isn't about politics, it's about science. <laughs> Although he didn't say whether Fauci had himself yelled the word. <laughs> but what were actual people who look at science say? Anyone know who this guy Nate Silver is? He runs the 538 blog. A lot of people, all liberals, think he's sort of like the high priest of data science. Here's what he had to say. Not that I had a particularly high opinion of it before, but the irrational and not very science-driven regime of COVID policies in California, coupled with the hypocrisy of so many elected officials there, has really lowered my opinion of the quality of governance in that state. 
We have had the worst lockdowns in the country. There's just a new survey a few days ago showing we ranked 51 out of 51 uh, when you include Washington, D.C. And yet, we've had some of the worst public health outcomes, we've had the worst economic outcomes, and we've had the worst educational outcomes. I mean, it is hard to imagine a more consequential failure of political leadership. The fifth adjective, incompetent. Now, the DMV has long been the poster child of government failure, but the new poster child is Gavin Newsom's EDD. Someone was just telling me they've been waiting for an EDD claim. My office has dealt with countless people. And let's just trace this from start to finish. So millions of Californians lose work, lose their jobs on the orders of Gavin Newsom. They have been paying taxes into a system that is supposed to compensate them and provide them modest checks when they lose their jobs. Gavin Newsom's incompetence fails to deliver them, keep the food off the table of many people. Yet there's one group of people for whom the delivery of benefits was swift and seamless. Who's that? California prisoners who weren't entitled to those benefits on a fraud that has now reached a scale of $31 billion. Jeez. And you might say, what a colossal waste. But if it were a waste, that would be much better. It's not just waste. That money's going to criminals. And just a couple days ago, district attorneys reported that it's being used by street gangs to buy weapons to terrorize our communities. That is the true price of Gavin Newsom's incompetence. And by the way, the federal government, our state auditor just found, warned Newsom several times about the fraud, and he didn't take the common sense measures that almost every other state did. Adjective number six. Hypocritical. I'll give you a couple more Gavin Newsom tweets. Anyone want, you might want more tweets. So, do I even need to explain the hypocritical chapter, by the way? That one kind of writes itself. But this is what he tweeted as soon as he announced this mask mandate. Don't be selfish, wear a mask. He tweeted it again. Don't be selfish, wear a mask. He tweeted 17 times and this is all caps, <laughs> wear a mask, or wear your mask, or wear period, a uh, period, mask period. He tweeted, be kind, wear a mask, be smart, wear a mask. He said mask wearing is a sign of toughness, a sign of someone who gives a damn. He called it a beautiful thing. He tweeted, me again, you really, 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 really need to wear a mask. A couple weeks later, came the French laundry. <laughs> yeah. And look, that just scratches the surface of Gavin Newsom's hypocrisy. He said his kids' a private school will close them down schools for less fortunate families, and it only scratches the surface of our capital's hypocrisy. For, for so long, we've had a political class that has subjected itself to a different set of rules that it forces upon everyone else. Seventh adjective, partisan. Gavin Newsom was already the most partisan governor in the country. In 2019, he tweeted about Mitch McConnell 27 times. It's nothing to do with his job. But he took this partisanship to perverse levels during COVID. He even released a chart that supposedly ranked red and blue states according to COVID cases. It was totally spurious. It was taken from a website called Dan's COVID Charts. <laughs> and yet the governor of California released this to the public. <laughs> The eighth and final adjective. I mean, you could probably come up with more adjectives, but the eighth one in the book, maybe some are coming to mind right now, <laughs> is neglectful. And by that I mean Gavin Newsom has neglected the basics of a public health response, except for the one thing that he seems to relish, which is restricting human activity. When it comes to testing, when it comes to protecting vulnerable populations, when it comes to our healthcare workers, you might remember he had something he called the California Health Corps to attract people to step up, doctors, nurses, other healthcare professionals. Californians did step up. 94,000 people signed up for it. It was really amazing. At the time he issued his stay-at-home order in December, because we didn't have sufficient healthcare capacity, do you know how many of those 94,000 were deployed? 21. Not 21,000. 21. 
And you know, in a way, it's just a more dramatic iteration of what we're all used to as Californians as we pay the highest taxes and drive over the deepest potholes. You know, sacrificing the most and getting the least in return. This state's problems were boiling over before COVID-19. We've had the highest homeless in the country by far, the worst poverty, the worst inequality, the worst education outcomes, especially for poor kids, the worst roads and bridges. There was a poll that came out shortly before COVID where 53% of Californians said they're thinking of leaving the state. Anyone there in that group? Yeah. Anyone know someone who's left the state in the last couple of years? Oh yeah. I mean, think about that, 53%. That's called a failed state when half your people want out. You know, Californians just countless wonders and beauty and our amazing population. It's all being overwhelmed by the failure of our politics. And I see the recall as an opportunity to fix our politics, to root out corruption, to restore government by the people. That to me is the larger meaning of the recall. It is a fundamental course correction. It's an emphatic rejection of the status quo. It's millions of people saying with one voice, enough is enough, giving full expression to those forgotten words from our Declaration of Independence, the consent of the government. It's a refusal to accept the inevitability of decline and failure as we the people take matters into our own hands. And look, you know, getting rid of Gavin Newsom won't fix everything in California overnight, as euphoric as it will be. It'll certainly stop further damage, but I do think that Gavin Newsom has provided us one other service. And he's provided something of a roadmap for how to move in the right direction. That's simply to do the exact opposite of everything that he has done. I mean, seriously, look at those eight adjectives. I call it the anti-Newsom roadmap. The opposite of Newsom's self-promotional mode of governance is humility. Not only in the conduct of the governor, but the role of our government, so it's not running our lives all the time. The opposite of Newsom's lawlessness is obeying the rule of law, respecting the Constitution. The opposite of Newsom's corruption is serving the public interest rather than special interests. The opposite of Newsom's unscientific mode of governance is accountability to facts and data and evidence. The opposite of Newsom's incompetence is a performance-based government. It's based on customer service, citizen service. The opposite of Newsom's partisanship is bringing people together to solve problems. The opposite of Newsom's hypocrisy is transparency. So our elected officials are subject to the same rules as everyone else. And the opposite of Newsom's neglect is responsibility. So we're not just kicking the can down the road, but we take responsibility for our shared future. So in closing, you know, some people say, why do we need to have a recall? We got an election coming up in 2022 anyway. And you know, the first response, of course, is that we can't let Gavin Newsom have two more years to run our state into the ground. But I actually think the timing is ideal because if the recall is successful, then any legislators who don't get the message that the era of corruption is over, they'll face voters themselves the following year. And the people of California will have a chance to affirm the new governor's approach to cement the recall's goals. So that this extraordinary movement isn't some one-off event, you know, some ephemeral moment of activism, but it reshuffles the whole stack deck of our political system and has lasting significance, sets us on a whole new course. And if that happens, you know, we can start leading the nation again in the right ways reclaim the sort of things we've always stood for as a state, opportunity, innovation, daring, the right to govern ourselves. So I want to thank everyone for being part of the movement to make this happen. Let's recall the governor and let's sign some books. Kevin will be inside to uh, sign the books. So Enjoy here. yourself. Bye. Right here. Okay, thanks everybody for coming inside. <laughs>